This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. This is the Lex Friedman Podcast, and here is my conversation with Neil Stevenson. write both historical fiction like World War II in Cryptonomicon and science fiction, mm -hmm. looking both into the past and the future. So let me ask, does history repeat itself? In which way does it repeat itself? In which way does it not? I'm afraid it repeats itself a lot. Um, so I, I think human nature kind of is what it is. And so we tend to see similar behavior patterns emerging again and again. And so uh, it's, it's kind of the uh, exception rather than the rule when something new happens. What role does technology play? In uh, the internet, um, these are all uh, improvements in most people's standard of living and health and longevity that um, that exceed anything that was seen before in, in human history. Um, so um, so people are living longer, they're generally healthier, and so on. Uh, but again, um, we still see a lot of the same behavior patterns, some of which are uh, not very attractive. So some of it has to do with the constraints on resources. Presumably with technology, you have less and less constraints on resources. So we get to maybe emphasize the better angels of our nature. And in, in so doing, does that not potentially fundamentally alter the sort of the, the experience that we have of you, life on earth? You know, until the last 10 or so years, I would have uh, taken that view, I think, but, um, you know, uh, people who will find ways to be, um, to be divisive and angry, um, if it scratches a kind of psychological itch that they have got. And, um, we used to look at the Weimar Republic. Just the, the, the misery that people were living in at that time. Um, the economic collapse. Yeah, hyperinflation and unemployment and... Um, explain what we've seen in this country in the last few years just strictly on the basis of uh, people are poor and angry and sad. I think they want to be angry. So without being political in a divisive kind of way, can we talk about the lessons you can draw f from World War II? Sure. This singular event in human history, it seems like. Yeah. And yet, as you say, history rhymes at the very least. But, uh, the well, there's several things, and sorry to interrupt. So one in Cryptonomicon is more like the Alan Turing side of things, yeah. right? Right. And then, and then there, there's the outside of technology well it's, first of all there's the tools of war yeah. which is a kind of technology mm -hmm. but then there's just like the human nature the nature of good and evil yeah well so one of the things that emerges from uh from the war and from the um the extermination camps is that we were never allowed to have illusions anymore about human nature so you you have to to learn that lesson to be uh, an educated person and you have to know that that even in a supposedly uh, in the form of very basic knowledge mm -hmm. which is like wikipedia mm -hmm. and search the original dream of google yeah that i think is very much a success which is making the world's information accessible at your fingertips that kind of technology 
enables the natural, if, if this uh, axiom, this assumption that people want to do good is, is true, yeah. then letting them discover all of the information out there, false information and true information, all of it. And, let and so AI, that's an assistant, that's a guide, like a mentor to you, yeah. that you can, in the way that this Google searches, but smarter, where you can help send it out and say, this is the direction in which I want. This is how you should grow, but almost uh, the, the opposite, where you use it as um, an assistant, uh, a, a servant in your journey towards knowledge. So yeah. That, that, that sounds like an easy thing, but it's actually, from an AI no, perspective, very difficult. I mean, this is the theme of a book I wrote called The Diamond Age, which you know talks about a book that essentially does that. And um, I've been sort of watching people try to come at the, the problem of building that thing uh, from different directions for ever since the book came out, basically. Um, and so uh, the uh, and, and so I, I kind of have a although I haven't worked on it myself, I do get a sense of the the level of difficulty in in realizing that 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 goal. Um, so that book is in the 90s. So as Google. And, but I see that pocket is way better than what we had before mm. in the 80s, right? Okay. In the 90s before the internet. But like, and now we're now, this is, this is also human nature. We start uh, writing very eloquent articles about how this pocket is clearly pocket. It's not very good, and we can imagine much better lands far beyond. And but the reality is, it's better than before. Yeah. And now we're waiting for we have to like escape new from book. the local yeah. minimum. And you have to wait either for lone geniuses or for some kind of momentum of a group of geniuses that just say enough is enough. I have an idea. Yeah. This, this is how we get out. And it's too easy to be sort of. I think. Uh, partially because you can get a lot of clicks in your articles, being cynical about being in this pocket. And we were forever stuck in this pocket. And then like coming up with this grandiose theory that humanity has finally, like is collapsing, stuck forever, like a prison in this pocket. <laughs> but reality, they're just, it's like, it's just clickbait articles and, and books until we, one curious ant comes up with the next pocket. Yeah, tunnels through the barrier or gets enough energy to jump over the, the barrier. And eventually we'll be, uh, as you've talked about, I mean, we'll be, we'll colonize the solar system and then... ...solar system and then, and so on. It goes on until we colonize the entirety of the observable universe. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think getting out of the solar system is going to be a hard one. But, uh, so can you you mention this? Can you elaborate why you think back to sort of a serious question? Why do you think it's hard to get outside of our solar system? It's just an energy calcul. I mean, you, you can do it slowly uh, whenever you want, um, but uh, the idea of getting there in you know a one lifetime or multiple. A few lifetimes is uh, requires huge amounts of energy to to accelerate, um, and then you as soon as you get halfway there, you need to expend an equal amount of energy to decelerate, or you'll just go shooting by. Um, and so um, that means carrying a lot of energy. And there's there's uh, ideas like Yuri Milner, I, I think, is still funding the the idea to use laser propulsion to send something uh, to another star system, a small object, um, but it'll have no way to slow down as far as right. I know. They never talk about that part. Yeah. Like how do we slow down? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so It's a quick flyby. You take a good picture, I guess. Yeah, you better take some good pictures on your way by. So, And that's great if it happens. I'm not knocking it, uh, but the amount of energy is is uh, that's needed is just staggering and there's there's other issues like just 
how do you maintain uh, 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 an ecosystem for that long in isolation? Uh, how do you prevent people? A stable society on a spaceship. Yeah, yeah, the, the generation ship, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's the only way. It would, it would have to keep... When you look at all those complications, then um, basically building uh, uh, sort of uh, exactly the environment we want out of available materials in this solar system starts to look a hell of a lot. Old rotating cylindrical space habitats and make them perfect. Well, is, isn't everything done for religious reasons? Like, why do we exploration yeah like what why why do we go to the moon again mm -hmm. and do the other things uh what is jfk said is because not because they're easy but because they're hard isn't that a, kind of a religious reason i knew a veteran of the apollo program who once said that the apollo moon landings were communism's greatest achievement <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the conflict between nations is a kind of um there's not a kind exactly of a religion, but it's what you're talking well, about. Well, it's a struggle for meaning. Yeah. I mean, uh, and that meaning isn't found in some kind of... It's, it's hard to find meaning in mathematics. Yeah. It's, it's found in some kind of... In music and religion, whatever, art. I mean, some people do, but those are probably not enough of them to... <laughs> Well, they uh, people yeah. that find beauty, uh, yeah. meaning in mathematics, yeah. they yeah. usually find meaning between the lines. Nevertheless, not in the actual uh, form, like the proving, sure. <laughs> proving some kind of thing. Fair enough. Yeah. So, from a cost perspective, do you actually see a possible future where we're be building these kind of generation ships and just why not launch them one a year mm -hmm. out? Like uh, like wandering ants out yeah. into the into the galaxy. I have nothing against it. Uh, it's just like I said, it's got a uh, the motivation to do it has to come from um, some kind of spiritual or or kind of non tangible uh, calculus. So, from say. a business model perspective, you don't think there's a business model there? No. No way. One of the many fascinating things you've done in your life, you were, at the very beginning, you were the person that conv convinced Jeff Bezos to start a, a spaceship company, a space company. Uh, you were there at Blue Origin uh, for a few years in the beginning, uh, working on alternate propulsion systems, and at least according to Wikipedia, uh, alternate business models. Yeah, I mean, to go back to the first thing you said, uh, Jeff Bezos is not a guy who required a lot of convincing. <laughs> um, he'd been thinking about it since he was five years old, and it was an inevitability. But um, the, the idea... ...small staff of people that, that did that for a few years, and I think it was about 2003, 2004, that... Uh, it swung decisively towards the direction it's it's been following ever since, which is you know using basically existing aerospace technologies and models to make chemical fueled rockets um, for space tourism. Uh, I believe, and I continue to believe that the the fact that we use chemical rockets is just an accident of history that comes out of World War II. Mm -hmm. It's, um, which is a terrible misallocation of resources. It's a terrible idea. But uh, so it only could have happened in a dictatorship controlled by a, a lunatic. Um, but that's that's the situation that existed. So they built these rockets. They, you know, that's the V2. Um, and then it's just a, a complete coincidence that that war ends with... Um, atomic bombs being developed in a completely separate super weapon program 
And so suddenly the, the existence of the bombs creates a demand for rockets that didn't exist before. Because if you've got mm-hmm. atomic bombs, you need a way to deliver them. You can do it with bombers, but uh, it's a lot better to just hurl them to the other side of the world on the top of a rocket. So, um, so suddenly rockets, which had gotten a boost because of Hitler's V2 program, got a much bigger boost during the, the 50s and 60s. And it is a complete, you're right, I, for some reason never thought of this. It is an accident of history that nuclear weapons are developed at a similar time. Yes. First of all, it, nuclear weapons didn't have to be developed at the same time as World War II. Right. That's an accident in history. Yeah. And then the fact that, okay, so then Hitler started using rockets. That's an accident. Of, okay, <laughs> that's fascinating. That's a fascinating... Uh... ...bombs that um, are so big and so devastating that um, nobody really wants to use them. But it turns out you can fit a capsule with a couple of people in it into the the socket on the end of a, uh, of a of a missile that was made to hold a hydrogen bomb, uh, so um, uh, so we start doing that instead uh, as a proxy for for having a war. Um, and um, I'd and love so- to be in the meeting where the first guy brought that up as an idea. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a Russian. Why don't we strap a person to the rocket? Yeah. Yeah, well, it probably was because they did it first, right? Uh, the Russians did it, and first. they had perhaps less respect for sort of safety protocols. Could be, they're a little bit more uh, willing to sacrifice the life of an astronaut or to risk the life of an astronaut. So. Could be, yeah, yeah. This is basically the story of how, through all of this competition and because of these historical accidents, you know, trillions of R and D dollars and rubles were put into. Um, development of chemical rocket technology, which is you know now advanced to an incredibly high degree, but there's other ways to make things go really fast, which is all, all that rockets do. That's all orbit is. It's just going really fast, um, and because so many nerds are obsessed with space, people have been uh, thinking about alternate schemes for as long as they've been thinking about rockets. Um, and so one of the first things that you that I learned, kind of trying to explore new possibilities, uh, was that I could put all of my brain power to work and, and be creative as I could and, and invent some idea that I thought was new for making things go fast. And I would always find out that some guy in Russia or somewhere had had thought the same idea up 50 years ago and figured out all the math, Yeah, you know? And so, so <laughs> at a certain point, you give up on trying to invent completely new ideas and just go poking around trying to find those guys. Um, so there's a number of... Uh, of ideas that we looked at, you know, some are crazier, some are less crazy, but um, the direction that that company eventually took was was chemical rockets. Is there something you can comment on possible ideas? Like, so first of all, like, I mean, uh, uh, like you could use nuclear, so nuclear pulse propulsion. Yeah, so that's, I mean, you've probably heard of Project Orion, which... Um, was the I, Freeman Dyson uh, and, and his, some of his collaborators had a scheme to um, to power a large space vehicle by detonating atomic bombs behind it. Um, and so one of the other people who was working at Blue Operations during this time was George Dyson, the son of Freeman. And so we knew all about Project Orion, and he found an old film that they'd shot on a beach in La Jolla of a prototype of this. Probably out of scope. So it was more of a theoretical 
thing. There's a conceptually similar approach using lasers that uh, that Freeman worked on with Arthur Kantrowitz and some others, where you take a pulsed laser and you fire it at a vehicle that has a block of ice on the back. And the pulse hits the uh, ice and flashes off a layer of steam that becomes plasma. And plasma is opaque because it conducts. Roll trick. Just, just, you know, just the physics of a moving bend of material in a medium um, can do this. So, um, so that's the thing I still think about from time to time. You can use the same physics to make freestanding loops of chain or, or other flexible materials um, that just kind of stand up under their own. Whip, but have at the end of it a spaceship. Yeah, that would detach at the moment of maximum velocity. Why, why not? <laughs> why wouldn't that? So part of my motivation in studying that was to ask that, that question. Yeah. It, was, it was more uh, almost a symbolic way of saying, look, there's all kinds of physics we haven't explored yet. Um, that's, it's no more crazy than the idea of chemical rockets. Um, it's just that uh, more money's gone into chemical. So I don't know if you've uh, seen quite a, a lot out of recent articles and reports. And There's a lot of reports about objects that moved in ways they haven't seen before that seem to uh, defy the laws of physics if we consider the aircraft that we have. Those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Or if it is aliens or objects from an alien civilization, I most likely believe if it's, from, if it's an object from an alien civilization, it's got to be like a really dumb drone that just like yeah. got lost. It's, <laughs> it's definitely not yeah. like the pinnacle <laughs> of intelligence. It's like... Some like teenagers, like uh, science like, fair experiment. Yeah, it just yeah. flew for yeah. for a few centuries out and just landed, and then we humans are all like really excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, uh, this wild thing. I mean, what do you, what do you think about those? Um, first of all, like the millions of reports of UFOs, right? There's some psychology there that's deeply cultural, uh, but also the possibility of aliens. <laughs> accelerate into into our solar system by uh, unless it got here really 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 slowly so i guess that's a, <laughs> that's a possibility and just kind of snuck in so the end we would detect some kind of footprint in terms of energy you would think so i actually think your idea of a science fair project gone gone bad you know it makes more sense in in that it would explain why these, if these things are alien technologies, they're just kind of hanging around our aircraft carriers for no particular reason, like doing, doing, not trying to communicate. Yeah. You know, is it, can you imagine a scenario where aliens have visited Earth or are visiting Earth and we wouldn't notice it at all? Oh, sure. I mean, if they've got technology to, to get here, they've probably got technology to, conceal the, the fact that oh they're, they're trying to conceal themselves i meant more like they're not trying to conceal themselves but um, we're just our too, cognitive capabilities are like too limited and we are not thinking big enough we're, um, we're looking for little green men yeah we're looking for things that operate at a time scale that's human-like uh you know it's yeah no i yeah i love thinking about ideas like that that's great 
science fiction novel fodder, you know, uh, that the aliens are are so different uh, that we simply don't don't see them. I mean, is there, um, you know, in terms of language, do you think it, it would be difficult, not aliens visiting us, but traveling to other places? To us, you know, I mean, there's a school of thought that says, basically, uh, advanced life has to be carbon-based for just reasons of chemistry. So right away, if you impose that limitation, then you're you're kind of assuming a uh, something that's starting to be biologically similar to us. So if they're about as big as we are, and uh, you know they um, they they kind of move around in in space, you know, in a physical body the way we do, then then there's probably a way to to solve that communication problem. Uh, if they're you know, like beings of pure energy from Star Trek or right. something like that, then it's a different story. <laughs> I asked the language question, can they commun- communicate? Yeah. Uh, um, can they fall in love before before sex? That's how it works. So which question are, am I answering, the sex or the, the love? Um, I mean... It depends what is more fundamental to relations across, yeah. yeah, across intelligent species. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, sex can mean a lot of things. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, uh, if your production, right? Y- you know, the the in in Star Trek, in classic Star Trek, you had to to really. <laughs> So if, if by sex you mean reproductive sex, then um, uh, I would say no, unless you, you unless you go to a panspermia um, kind of theory, which is that uh, you know humans were seeded onto the planet as part of a galactic uh, you know uh, uh, program of some of some sort, hmm. um, and then we're just returning home, yeah, and hanging out with our with old relatives distant cousins yeah yeah, yeah. um <laughs> but that that doesn't seem you know it doesn't seem seem plausible we we know that we know that humans had sex with neanderthals with denisovans denisovans um so you could think of them as aliens that that came from our planet um so um so that's a kind of data point i guess um but um you know if you broaden your definition of sex to mean any kind of uh gratifying physical interaction then sure right <laughs> dancing and that's that's how we get to love okay and love can take many forms love can certainly take many forms i have to ask you um in terms of space just looking at where blue origin is look <laughs> his video the, this morning before I came here. Yeah. <laughs> Are yeah. you impressed the where things stand today? Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean SpaceX in particular is has done things that are just unbelievable. Um and um uh, I don't think anyone was anticipating um 20 years ago, let's say, when this all started, just the uh the speed with which they'd be able to um, rack up these incredible achievements. If you've kind of uh, even seen a little bit of how the sausage is made and, and so the, the, the difficulty of, of doing any kind of space travel, um, what they've achieved is, uh, is just, uh, is, is unbelievable. What about the, maybe... unapologetically ambitious at achieving the impossible at what a lot of people would say is impossible. I think that colonizing Mars is the kind of, of goal that's, uh, it's easily stated. Uh, it's, um, it's catchy. It's, it's, it's the kind of thing that, that can inspire people to get involved in a way that some other programs might not. 
Um, so I think it's well chosen in that way. Um, I have technical questions about, um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a, a problem of perchlorates uh, on the surface of Mars that's, that's going to be big trouble. Um, and there's, there's radiation. So and it, this is known. I'm, uh, but um, what about business questions? Do you think, because you mentioned sort of uh, going outside of the solar system would would best be done for religious reasons. Um, what about colonizing Mars? Can you spin it into a business proposition? It's hard to think of a resource that's on Mars that could... ...plan for that, or if it's just strictly... We're going to go there and and see what happens. Um, you know, maybe again we need communism to kind of yeah to, to get us going <laughs> to give us a reason a little bit of the competition. Well, there's plenty of people who are sufficiently excited by the colonized Mars vision that they're willing to to just go all in on it, um, even if there's not a, a business plan behind it. Um, so, so I think it's well chosen. It's just, uh, um, uh, I, I think it's probably the only, um, to do it for the kind of the like unexplainable love of the unknown, like, like the, the, uh, the journey towards exploring the unknown. Yeah. And just kind of keep going. Yeah. And well, you saw it with Shatner and his uh, reaction to the the flight uh, yesterday. Um, he, uh, um, for him, that trip was more than worth it, just for these intangible reasons. What did he say? I haven't watched the video yet. He was trying to express the, the talking a lot about the moment where suddenly you kind of rise above the the thin blue blanket of uh of the atmosphere and and you're up into the the blackness um and uh that had a huge impact on him so he was kind of uh i wouldn't say groping yeah and uh i mean things have slowed down uh quite our, our ability to um to, to build things uh, uh, at pace um, is is a lot less than it was, and there's there's reasons for that. You know, we're more concerned with safety. I certainly hope that we're not you know, ten years from now that we're not exactly where we are today when it comes to to that stuff. We need to move on. The beautiful thing about problems is they show you how not to do things. Yeah. And then, uh, a dream for me in, in the, to see um, new social media. Yeah. That beats out the ways of the old. So I, I, I tend to, you perhaps agree that it's not, that it's impossible to do social media well. Oh, not at all. I mean, I, I listened to your uh, interview with Jaron a couple of weeks ago, and I, I I know Jaron, and we've you know we've talked about this, and he went he went hard on me. He basically said like it, it is it's very, impossible. <laughs> it's very nice. Well, the last time I kind of paid attention to Jaron's thoughts on it, he was thinking in terms of that basically there should be, you know, micro payments uh, such that if I, by clicking the like button on something, I'm essentially giving um, valuable intellectual property to Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Uh, it's not a very large amount of IP, but it's definitely a transfer of information that, that when they aggregate it is beneficial to them. So... And now I now I do remember that he uh, on on his interview with you was talking about what data unions or mm -hmm. yeah words 
people in Silicon Valley being able to do these kinds of things. And I'm really, okay, when you have a large crowd of people that are doing things the wrong way, mm -hmm. you should nevertheless maintain optimism because what's important is to find the one person in that room that's going to do things the right way. Cynicism is going to completely silence out the whole room. So he was saying, I've, I've been here a long time. Oh, yeah. I, I've known, you know, I, I understand like how these folks work they think they're gods and they know the right way to do things and they will tell you how to do those things and that kind of hubris is going to always lead you astray when you are the one who's engineering the algorithms and there's a lot of deep truth to that because algorithms are powerful and uh many people when given power do not do the best of things. I mean, most, what, what is it, uh, the old Lincoln line, if you want to test the man's character, give him power. Yeah. Yes, but that doesn't mean that some people are not able to handle the power, that some people are not able to come up with good uh, ideas that create better social media. Yeah, I didn't interpret Jaron's statements as as being entirely cynical and, and hopeless. I mean, he's, he's definitely raising you know issues of concern um but he wouldn't be out you know writing the books that he's written and talking about this stuff if he didn't think there was a way if if he didn't think there was hope yeah and part of it as you probably know with jaron he just loves a good argument yeah <laughs> he just loves to have a little bit of fun well i have to ask you about uh i mean we talked about taking all big bold risky ideas so in your new book termination shock it's set here in texas part, is, part of it is yeah yeah which most is a, most of it yeah it's a great place to set it so in it the main character tr mccooligan a texas billionaire oil man and truck stop magnate decides to solve climate change to take on climate change by himself so this is an interesting philosophical exploration of how to solve climate change from a perspective that's perhaps different than we've been thinking about. Yeah, I wouldn't so, I wouldn't use the word solve, but let's say ameliorate, ameliorate. the temporary effects. But please take on. Yeah. Take on the challenge. So it's it's very interesting, but as so, so there's a gradual nature to this yeah. process. And I mean, just like in 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 your book, um, the power of innovation is something that has uh, saved us quite a few times in history. So, what role does that play as in, in this gradual process? Right. So, ultimately, we don't solve. <laughs> Those are two different kind of uh, yeah. efforts in terms of like what's involved. Because it stays up there. So I think just like saying will be net zero. So if everyone in the world does that and the PPM of CO2 in the atmosphere by then is say 450 parts per million, it'll stay at 450 parts per million until we take it out <clears throat> and taking it out um, is hard. It's a, you know, it's a big, we, we, it took us a long time. We had to empty out huge coal mines and oil reservoirs and burn all that stuff. We had to chop down forests and dig up peat bogs um, in order to create all of that CO2. And so we have to reverse all of those processes uh, somehow in order to remove the CO2 and get it back down, hopefully into the 200 and some parts per million range where it used to be. So how about you get a, a single Texas billionaire? ...up into the stratosphere to take some samples of the plume. And when it came back down, the windscreen of the plane had sort of a deposit on it so one of the Australian scientists licked it 
and reported that it was painfully acid. Mm -hmm. So that was our first kind of clue that what was being injected into the stratosphere was sulfur dioxide. Um, so, um, and, and so we know, but then well, Pinatubo came along in the 90s and, and did this experiment for us. So we know that sulfur in the, uh, in the stratosphere, it forms little uh, spherical droplets of sulfuric acid after it combines with water, and those bounce back some of the sun's rays and um, reduce the amount of, of solar energy entering the troposphere, which is where we live. So, um, so we know that it works, and we we also know that the stuff goes away after a couple. And you'll get back to where you started. And the, the the bad news, if if you're in favor of this kind of thing, is that you have to keep doing it forever. Or um, so so this guy is one of those. He he's read these papers. He he under, the TR the character in the book. He knows all this, and all all people who uh, are familiar with climate science are kind of know this. It's a pretty well established fact, and so. Um, he just decides he's going to take action unilaterally and and do this. Um, and so uh, there's different ways to get the sulfur up there, but because it's Texas, he builds the biggest gun in the world. Yeah. Uh, it's just six barrels. That have different effects on different parts of the world. So some areas may suffer... Um, negative, uh, you know, more negatives than positives, uh, and they're not going to be happy. So what do you think? Uh, so in, in his case, in TR's case, he can get around, you know, getting permission from governments. If we were to look at our, us facing, um, outside of the store, us facing climate change, where do you think the solution will come from? Governments working together or from uh, bold billionaire Texans? I'm pretty sure that this kind of intervention is never going to emerge from Western democracies. Um, just, uh, this kind of, sorry, government coordinated, uh, uh, which, which option one so or option? Solar geoengineering. Solar geoengineering. Yeah. Uh, from a government, from our, uh, from, like those are, I, I, I want to sort of the distinction. One is the idea, the technological idea you're talking about, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. two, uh, two is like who comes up with the idea and agrees on it, governments yeah. or individuals. Yeah. If this were to happen, I think it would be either an individual or more likely just a, a some government somewhere that just decides it's in their interests to to unilaterally do this and you know that's not me advocating it it's just uh it's so it would be comparatively so cheap and easy to implement the a solar geoengineering scheme that um someone is probably going to do it once things get get bad enough but i don't think that the governments will i th or western governments just because they're not um well we, we've seen what happened with with vaccines right so um you know getting getting people to to take vaccinations or wear masks you know has turned out to be incredibly hard even though it might it might save those people's lives. See, I blame, that's not Western. That's, I blame failure of leadership there, of, mm -hmm. of leaders being, not coming off as... ...of uh, GDP into becoming a multi-planetary species. And what percent should that be, you think? You know, in an indirect way, maybe. I mean, you know what people will say, which is it's the same argument that has been leveled against space exploration since the Apollo program, which is why don't we solve our problems here on Earth before we uh, 
spend money going into space. So I've never been a believer in that that argument. Um, I think um, there could be a, a sense in which the new perspective that could be obtained by uh, you thinking about, like if we're thinking about terraforming Mars, changing its atmosphere, making it more amenable to to life and survival, um, you, you could see that maybe. <laughs> and 60s, there was a, a period of time there when um, people maybe had unrealistic ideas about new technology and weren't sufficiently attentive to the possible downsides. So um, so we got, um, and, and there's a reason why, I mean, uh, the, the, there's, the, you know, in, in the mid 20th century we saw you know antibiotics we saw the polio vaccine we saw um just simple things like refrigerators in the home you know um my my grandmother to her dying day called the refrigerator the ice box because when she grew up it was a box with ice in it so you see all that change, and it's largely for the benefit of people. And so if somebody comes along and says, hey, we're going to build nuclear reactors to, to make energy, or um, here's a new um, chemical called DDT that's going to kill uh, mosquitoes, then... And deal with the the waste um, was was poorly thought out, and uh, and and we're still dealing with the uh, the the resulting problems at places like Hanford in in the state of Washington. And we know that uh, DDT, although it did kill a lot of insects, um, also had terrible effects on bird populations. Um, so the the kind of backlash that happened in the seventies that is still kind of going on is is to sort of assume that everything is a double edged sword and always to look for to, to you know we have to absolutely convince ourselves that the the downside uh, isn't going to come back and and bite us uh, before we can adopt any new technology. And I, I think the, the people, um, people are overly sensitized to that now. <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny. Depending on the technology, people are a little bit too terrified of certain technologies, like artificial intelligence is one. My sense is that the things that they're afraid of aren't the things that are likely going to happen in terms of negative things. It's probably impossible to predict exactly the unintended negative consequences. But what's also interesting is for AI as an example, not... Currently are also in part just revealing the basics of human nature. It didn't make us worse, it's just it's bringing it to the surface. And step one of solving a problem is bringing it to the surface. The fact that we are divis there's a division, the fact that there we're easily angered and upset and all all of that, the witch hunts, all those kinds of things, mm -hmm. that's human nature. And it just reveals that allowing us to now work on it, it's therapy. Yeah. <laughs> and so that that's another example of a technology that's just we're we're not considering the sort of the po positive effects now and in the future enough of. I have to ask you about. Um, there's a million things I can ask you about, but virtual reality. I got got to ask you. Uh, you've thought about virtual reality, mixed reality, uh, quite a bit. W what are the uh, interesting trajectories you see for the proliferation of virtual reality? Or mixed reality in the next yeah. So I was um, I was a magically of people in in Seattle doing what you might call content R and D. So we're trying to make content for AI. 
project. So it was fascinating to see um, everything that goes into making uh, an AR system that runs. Um, so AR, um, an AR device, if it's really going to do AR, needs to be running slam in real time. And that alone is a big... As, so for people who don't know, first of all, virtual reality is creating a almost fully artificial world and putting you inside it, augmented. <laughs> but in a way that creates a pleasant experience for the human perception system is, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an engineering project. Right. Yeah. Well said. And it's just one of the things that the system has to do. It's also tracking your eyes. Um, and it's got to uh, keep doing that without, you know, burning up the, the CPU or, or, or uh, depleting the battery uh, unreasonably fast. And that's, that's just table stakes it's just the basic functions of the the operating system and then any content that you want to add has to sit on top of that it's got to be rendered by the optics um, at a sufficiently low latency that um, it looks real and you don't get sick so it's an amazing thing and um, you know man. but I don't know any more about that than anyone else because I don't work there anymore. Hmm. Um, what, th does it still, in, to some degree, boil down to a killer app, a, a content question? Like you said, it's kind of a wide open space. Nobody knows exactly what's going to be the compelling thing. Yeah. So doesn't a super compelling experience of some sort alleviate some of the need for engineering perfection? Well, there's a, a base layer of engineering that you have to have, no matter what. So invaders that, um, that uh, realize the, the potential of, uh, of AR gaming in a way that I don't think anything else has uh, before or since. Um, and um, so that was definitely the strategy um, <clears throat> until, uh, what, April 2020, which is when the company decided to uh, pivot to commercial industrial applications instead. Um, so, um, and, you know, I, I, I haven't seen their 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 financial projections, but I assume they had good reasons for, for making that strategic decision. Um, it just means that it's no longer, uh, necessarily targeted at, at just end users who want to play a game or, or be entertained, but it's, you know, that to me from a sort of a, a dreamer future. <laughs> Robotics, where to me the future of robotics is consumer facing uh, and a lot of great roboticists boston dynamics and uh, companies like that are focused on sort of industrial applications yeah because yeah, for financial business reasons yeah no i i can see the parallels for sure you know, we'll see. It was a fun uh, project. You know, we uh, uh, we worked on a, an app, for example, called Baby Goats, which just populated your room with with baby goats. That seems like a killer app, right there. Well, so we we thought highly of the of the idea for sure. Yes. Um. So, <laughs> but because of the slam, uh, the the um. The system knew, for example, here's a table. It's a reality or physical reality. What wins? Meaning like what's, uh, yeah. what do people of that have financial resources 
enjoy spending most of their time in. Mm-hmm. I've always been a fan of, 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 of AR, and it's kind of an easy answer. Because seeing, then you'll get sick, uh, unless you're a very unusual person. So it doesn't mean you can't do it. It just, it's a, a constraint that VR designers have to, uh, to learn to work with. So do you think it's possible that in the future we're living mostly in a virtual reality world? Like we become more and more detached from physical reality. For entertainment, maybe for certain applications. Um, I'm personally more, uh, I mean, the, we have to make a distinction between what I would personally find interesting and, you know, what might win in, in the market. So maybe some people, maybe lots of people would like to spend a huge amount of time in, in VR. Um, I'm personally more interested in um, enhancing the experience that I have of the, the physical world because the physical world's pretty cool, right? And there's a lot, lot to be said for, uh, for moving around in the real world. And can I ask you for you personally yeah. to try to play devil's advocate or to try to construct. To... Yeah. But like literally it's just more, enriching in the same way like there's a glimmer in your eye when you said you enjoy the physical world like uh double up on that glimmer for the for, okay. the, for the virtual reality can you imagine yeah. such a world well like i'll give maybe an example that's a bridge which is that i've been um i like making things um so i like working in a machine shop and 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 making objects with 3D printers or machines or whatever. And so I've had to learn how to get good at um, using a CAD program. Uh, you know, there's many. I can spend hours in that um, trying to create, imagine and create the things I want to create. And it's a... Uh, um, it's not virtual reality exactly, but that whole time, I'm, you know, my whole field of view is occupied by uh, by this monitor that's showing me a window into a three dimensional space. I'm rotating things around. I'm I'm uh, I'm imagining things. I'm making things, and so that is, um, you know, pretty close to. Um, to, to being in virtual reality. Does that thing have to exist for you to experience true joy? Can you stay in Fusion 360 the whole time? Do you have to 3D print it and touch it? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's my game. That's that's what I'm up to. But, you know, it happens that um, if you're building a virtual environment, if you're... Uh, making a game level or creating a virtual set for a film or TV production, the thing that you're designing in the program may never physically exist. Uh, and in fact, it's preferable that it doesn't because you, the whole point of that is to, um, is to, to make imaginary things that, uh, that you couldn't, couldn't build otherwise. So I think lots of people spend a good chunk of their working hours in something that's pretty close to to VR. It's just that currently the output device happens to be a rectangular object mm -hmm. in front of them. Uh, you could replace that with uh, a VR headset and they'd be doing the same stuff. There's all kinds of interfaces. For example, I enjoy listening to podcasts or audiobooks, but let's say actually podcasts. Because there's a uh, intimate human connection in a podcast. It's one way, but you get to learn about the person you're listening to, and that's a real connection. And that's just audio mm -hmm. for a lot of people. That's just audio. True. And like for me, that that's just audio. As a fan of people, I, and you kind of a little bit are friends with those people. Yeah, you know they're in your life. You're listening yeah. to them. Yeah, and I mean. They're not, they're as far away from real 
as he gets. There's not even a yeah. There's not even a visual component. It's just audio. But they're as real. Like if I was on a desert island, like my imagination, like this thing works pretty good in terms of imagination. Like that, it creates a very beautiful world with a with just audio. So I. I mean, or even just reading books. Just read, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're reading books, yeah, even more so with reading books, because uh, there there's certain mediums which stimulate the imagination more. Mm -hmm. The yeah, the when when you present less, the imagination works more. It seems to me the answer there is obviously yes, even if. I, like you, am attached to a lot of stuff in the physical world. I think I can very readily imagine coming up with some of the same magical experiences in the virtual world where you f make friends and you can fall in love where the source of love in your life is uh, to a much greater degree inside of a virtual world. And like in that, read this stuff because that I have to. That's a, a necessary constraint that helps me um, do a better job. What's the? Uh, this might be a tricky question to answer. What's uh, comes to mind as a particularly beautiful thing that you're proud of that you create inside Mathematica, visualization wise, or? Uh, something that just comes to memory if, if it's possible to retrieve. So the the thing I've spent the most amount of time on is I got obsessed um, a long time ago with trying to tile the globe with hexagons. Yes. And... Um, An or, actual globe? Well, any spherical, any, any spherical okay. object, yeah, yeah, but but with an eye towards uh, putting it on the earth. And so, uh, and have it be recursive. So you can have hexagons within hexagons, which is hard because, and probably a bad idea, because you can't tile a hexagon with smaller hexagons. They don't, they stick out. Got it. So they're, oh, they stick out. So there's a, can you do some kind of fractal hexagon situation? Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> so it's that. Pretty cool, but um, it, there's some like surprisingly intractable problems that keep coming up. Like you, you've always got to have some pentagons. Like if you start with the icosahedron, which is equilateral, triangles which is a logical place to start you can cover those with hexagons but every vertex I, okay. uh, what are some likely interesting trajectories for the proliferation of ai in society over the next couple of decades do you think about this kind of stuff i do not think about it a lot because it's a deep topic and I'm not, I don't consider myself super well informed about it. And AI seems to be a term that is applied to a lot of different things. So I've messed around just a tiny little bit with, with neural nets, with uh, what's it called? PCA, principal component analysis. So I, I guess I tend to think in terms of sort of granular bottom up um ideas rather than big picture top down you know oh god like, so like very specific algorithms like how are they going to what problem are they, are they going to solve in society such that that has like a lot of big ripple effects see i i mean we could talk a, a particular successful ai systems and success defined in different ways of recent years so one is language models with GPT-3, 
uh, most importantly, they're self-supervised, meaning they don't require much supervision from humans, which means they can learn by just reading a huge amount of content created by humans. So read the internet and from that be able to generate text and do all kinds of things like that. Mm -hmm. It's possible they have a big enough neural network, it's going to be able to have conversations with humans based on just reading human language. That's an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. To me, the very interesting idea that people don't think about it as AI because it's, they're kind of dumb currently is actual embodied robots. So robotics, like mm -hmm. Boston Dynamics. I have downstairs and upstairs uh, legged robots. Oh. Uh, you know, uh, the currently Boston Dynamics robots and most legged robots most robots, period, are pretty dumb. So most of the challenges have to do with the actual, first of all, the engineering of making the thing work, mm -hmm. getting a, a sensor suite that allows you to do, it's the same thing as with Magic Leap, that yeah. base layer of like- Where is it stuff? Where am I? Yeah. And uh, what, what am I looking at? <laughs> yeah. I don't need to deeply understand uh, my surroundings at a level of like, like uh, at a level beyond of what will hurt if I run into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even that is hard. Future in society, which is the more you integrate AI systems of whatever form into society where humans are uh, in contact with them regularly. So that could be embodied robotics or that could be social media algorithms. I think that has a very significant impact. And people often think like AI needs to be super smart to have an impact. I've been to a few BattleBots competitions and that's not like, in a lot of ways, that's pretty far from the kind of robotics you're talking about, um, because the, these robots are remote controlled. They're they're not autonomous, um, and so um, they're they're pretty simple. But um, it's interesting to watch people's emotional reactions to different robots. So there was one that was in the last year's season, the 2020 season, called Rusty, that. Uh, was just uh, like put together out of spare parts and it looked kind of cute. Mm -hmm. And it became this huge crowd favorite because you could see it was made of like salad bowls and, you know, random pieces of hardware that this guy had like scavenged from his farm. And so immediately people kind of fell in love with this one particular robot, whereas they might, uh, other robots might be like the bad guy in a... Uh, you know, if you think of professional wrestling, you know, the heel and the baby face. So people do, for reasons that are hard to understand, form these emotional reactions. And we form narratives in the same way we do when we meet human beings. We tell stories about yeah. these objects and they can be intelligent and they can be biological or they can be uh, in almost, almost close to inanimate objects. Yeah. And that to me is kind of fascinating and uh, fascinating place where there's this feedback loop, like you said, where AI, when it's especially when it's embodied, puts a mirror to ourselves, just like other humans are our, our close friends. They kind of teach us about ourselves. We teach each other and through that process grow close. And it, to me, it's so fascinating to, um, to expand the space of deep, meaningful interactions beyond just humans. Hmm. That, um, th that's the opportunity I see with, uh, with robots and with AI systems. And that's why I don't like, my biggest problem with social media algorithms is the lack of transparency. It's mm -hmm. not the existence of the algorithms. It's 
uh, well, there's, there's many things. One is the data. Data should be controlled by the individual, by people yeah. themselves. So, uh, but also the lack of transparency and how the algorithms work. And change your perception of what's real. Yeah. In, yes. in hidden ways. Yeah. In hidden ways. Yeah. Like you should be aware, just like when you take, I don't know, if, if you take psychedelics, you should be aware that you took the psychedelics. <laughs> it shouldn't be a surprise. Yeah. And second, you should... I mean, uh, become a student and a scholar and there should be research done. There should be open conversation about how your perception has changed. And you, and then you are become your own guide in this world of altered perception because arguably none of it is real. You get to choose the flavor of real. Um, I mean, th this is something you explore a bottom to it where there is reality there's a base layer of reality that physics can ex explore and our human perception sort of layer stuff is there is there let's go to plato is there such a thing as truth i lean towards the platon <laughs> invented um the <clears throat> um i i i did a lot of or not a lot but i did some some reading of husserl uh, when i was re writing anathem um and he's a you know 20th century phenomenologist and he's writing in the he's writing at the same time as as scientists are starting to understand atoms, and and becoming aware that um, that when we look at this table, it's really just a, a slab of almost entirely vacuum, and there's a very sparse uh, arrangement of tiny, tiny little. <laughs> um, hard to read. Uh, it you really have to take it in small bites um, and go a little bit at a time. Uh, but he's trying to come to grips with these with these kinds of of questions. How did you come to grips with it? Like why why does this table feel solid? Well, I mean, we're an evolved system that there's we have biological advantages in. <laughs> Just um, so um, consensus, it just that's, sits that's there. Cool. Yeah, and if if you hear a door slam, you might turn to to see what it is. If the robot at the same time turns to to look at the door slam, it's ratifying your perception. But isn't that the basis of love? Is when the door slams, you both look, but for deeper things. You both hear the same music and others don't. I mean, and someone might make a, a funny remark or a, a not so funny remark or um, something would happen. And you might then at that moment make eye contact with someone you didn't know at the other end of the table. And in that moment, you would realize this person is reacting. This person heard what I heard. They're reacting the way I reacted. Yeah. Nobody else appears to get the joke or to, to understand what just happened, but random stranger down there and I, we have this connection. Yeah. And then you, you build on that. So then the next time something happens, you automatically look at your new friend and they look back at you and and before you know it you know you're you're hanging out together yeah because you you know you've already established without even talking to each other that uh you're on the same wavelength yeah it happened around that view of things that there were efforts to figure out jurisdictions where this might work there was uh a lot of interest for a while in Anguilla, which is a Caribbean island that 
had some unusual jurisdictional properties. Um, there was sea land, <coughs> sea land, which is a, a platform in the North Sea. Um, and so there was a lot of effort. Picture in a lot of ways because um, uh, you no longer have, I mean, from a novelist point of view, the old system was a lot more fun to work with because it gives you a situation where hackers are wandering around in strange parts of the world, mm -hmm. you know, trying to set up server rooms. So that's a great storytelling thing. There's well, still a little bit of that, right, in, in the modern world, but it's just there's several server rooms as opposed to one centralized one. Yeah, yeah. And there is the, like, the new wrinkle is the need to do a lot of computation and to keep your your uh, your your GPUs from melting down. So people building things in Iceland or or in shipping containers on the bottom of the ocean or whatever. Um, so, um, but there's still governments involved, and there's there's still, from a novelist perspective, interesting dynamics. Mm -hmm. What is big governments like uh, China and and more sort of renegade governments from all over the world trying to contend with this idea of what to do uh, in terms of control and power over these kinds of centers that do the mining of the yeah. of the cryptocurrency. Yeah, so we're in a stage now that kind of goes beyond the initial, like there's the stuff I was describing in Cryptonomicon had a little bit of a air about it of the underpants gnomes uh, in that. You know. The, where Bitcoin, you know, blockchain exists, people know how it works. Uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies exist, people are using them. And it's sort of like, okay, what now? You know, where does this all lead? Um, so. Um, Do you have a sense of where it all leads? Like, is it is it possible that the set of technology kind of continues to have uh, transformational effects on n not just sort of finance, but who gets to have power in this world. So the decentralization. Of the way people think about this that I'm not so sure about. Maybe. There, there's a there is a technological aspect to to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that make it a little easier to uh, pull along the, th the utopian thread. Yeah. Because it's harder for governments to control Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, they, they have much fewer options. The, 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 they can ban, they can make it illegal. It's, di it's more difficult. Yeah. Uh, and so technology here is on the side of the powerless, the voiceless, which is a very interesting idea of course yes it, it does have a utopian feel to it but we have been making progress throughout human history yeah and maybe this is what progress looks like there will be the powerful and the greedy and the bureaucrats that take advantage of it skim off the top kind of thing but maybe this does give um more power to people that haven't had power before in a good way like distributing power and enabling sort of more um, greater resistance to sort of uh, dictatorships and uh, authoritarian regimes, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and also enabling all kinds of technologies built, built on top of it. Ultimately, when you digitize money, uh, you know, money is a kind of speech or it's, it's, it's a kind of like um, mechanism of how humans interact and if you make that digital more and more of the world moves to the digital space and then you could have the you, then you can finally fully live in that virtual reality with the toaster and then <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah in a lot of ways i think in that realm of technology that the money per se is one of the less interesting things you can do with it so i think you know cryptographically enforceable contracts and um and organizations built on 
actual data versus kind of perceptions of data. And if you can formalize, like distribute the power of who gets to tell the story, yeah, that that's an interesting kind of um, resistance yeah. to again the, the well, powerful in the space of narrative. Yeah, David Brin has been saying for a while that um, the only way to settle arguments with you know, across the political divide is to to make bets. So people can say, you know, the election was stolen or, you know, what whatever controversial position they're they're taking. Um and it, they'll keep saying it until you you uh you you wager real money on it. Um so um so maybe there's something there um, if you could uh, kind of turn that into a, put a user interface on that, <laughs> say, you know. Um, yeah, have a stake in your, uh, in your divisiveness, in your, in yeah. your arguments. Right. right. Oh. Will uh, Dogecoin take over the world? Twitter question. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't follow the, the different coins that much. So I don't, I, I mean, I hear about Dogecoin and I, you know, I, I've kind of followed the story of it. Contracts and and uh, resist the, the the banks and all those kinds of things. Dogecoin operates more in the space of memes and humor, while still doing some of the similar things, and it presents to the world sort of a question of whether um, memes whether humor, whether narrative will go a long way in the future. Like much farther than some kind of boring old uh, grounded technologies, whether we're, we'll be playing in the space of fun. Hmm. Like once we built a base of comfort and stability and like a robust system where everyone has shelter, everyone has uh food and the basic needs covered are we going to then operate in the space of fun hmm. that's that's why i think about dogecoin because it seems like fun spreads faster than anything else fun of different kinds and there could be bad fun and there could be good fun yeah and so it's a, it's a battle of of it, good fun it goes, goes viral fun. very very quickly when you when you if, you if you post something that people find fun to yeah and that's what dogecoin represents so there's like so bitcoin represents like financial uh, like s serious financial instruments yeah and then dogecoin represents fun hmm. and okay. it's interesting to watch the battle go on on the internet to see which wins this is also like an open question to me of what is the internet because um it was later on that people started using it for fun frivolous things like memes um and that's i think that's pretty much unstoppable <laughs> you know yeah because um, even people who are very serious uh you know enjoy um sending around a funny picture or uh, something that amuses them. Yeah, I I personally think we spoke about World War II. I think memes will save the world and prevent all future wars. You've been handwriting your work for the past twenty years mm -hmm. since writing the Baroque Cycle. What are the pros and cons of handwriting versus typing? For me, I started so. I just decided to keep with that. If it got in my way, I didn't like it. I could always just go back to the word processor and be right. fine. So, but I never, that never happened. So there's a certain security that comes from knowing that it's ink on paper and there's no uh, operating system crash or software failure that can obliterate it. Um, there's, um, um, I, it's a slower output technique. And so um, 
a, a sentence or a paragraph spends a longer time in the buffer up here before it gets committed to paper, whereas I can type really fast. And so I can slam things out before I've really thought them through. So I think the first draft quality ends up being higher. Um, and then editing, first draft of editing is just faster because um, instead of like trying to move the cursor around or whatever, uh, or, you know, hitting the back. The physical, you know, the touch of the pen to the paper, I doing think, what has been done for centuries. I think there is. I think there's a uh, just the simplicity of it and not having any intermediary technology beyond the, the pen and the paper. From Italy a few years ago because uh, I, I thought I would be more conservative with it. You know, it, but it still doesn't. It it's still a, a trivial expenditure, so it doesn't really alter my my habits very much. Uh, so all that said, you once you do type stuff up, you you use Emacs. Yeah, I use Emacs. Obviously, the superior editor. Of course. You uh, let me just ask the ridiculous futuristic question because Emacs has been around forever. Mm -hmm. Do you think in 100 years we will still have Emacs and Vim? Or like pick a, pick a let's say 50, 100 years, yeah, 20 yeah, years? Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, whenever you're doing anything in Linux, you, you're spending a lot of time editing little config files and scripts and stuff. And uh, you need to be able to pop in and out. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of, um, what's the story of the, the, there's the, the f American folktale of the, 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 the guy who, the hammer guy who drives the railroad spikes, John Henry, mm -hmm. trying to keep up with the steam hammer. And eventually this, the steam hammer wins because he can't drive the spikes fast enough. So there's, there's a sense in which you know, Microsoft, like, who knows how much they've invested in code. All of those features um, by, you know, if you just have enough Linux hackers writing Emacs Lisp macros. Um, but, you know, it, at some point, um, it's going to be hard to to maintain that time yeah and i i think you've you talked about that the, there's a certain like there's certain fads uh certainly in the in the um software engineering space and it's interesting to think about technologies that sort of last for a very long time mm -hmm. and just kind of being in the what is it how do they get by it's like the the uh the cockroaches of software or yeah. the, the bacteria of software delay with a little bit of customization by individuals kind mm -hmm. of that but they're always there in the shadows yeah and they outlast everybody else and I wonder if that's that that might be the story for a lot of technologies, especially in the software space. Yeah, you know, shell scripts, you know, all that stuff. You 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 can't run the modern world without a, a bunch of shell scripts, you know, booting up machines and 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 running things. So um, it's uh, that is going to be a hard thing to to replace. And then tech for typesetting that you use, you said. For when I when I want to print it out, yeah, I just have oh. some simple uh, macros that I use. But then I have to um, the the publisher put their foot down and they they want it in in Word format now. So oh, no. um, 
years ago I wrote some macros to convert and this time to do italics in uh, uh. you know you you put it in curly brackets and you do backslash it mm -hmm. and then you type what you want to type and that's how you get italics in tech so you can create a regular expression that'll look for some text. UI. You can do regular expressions. Is, is just reg ups. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's funny that you did that. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's tools that help you with that kind of thing, but, but the, the task is sufficiently simple to where you can do a much better job than anyone, anybody else's tool can. Yeah, yeah. So that's that a fascinating process. <laughs> works fine for me. Yeah, um, and it keeps you from messing around with formatting. Yeah. Like, oh, what if I put this chapter heading, you know, in, you know, a sans serif font? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's just classic wanking. <laughs> um, and so you, the. the, the those options are closed off in what I'm doing. Is there advice you could say, what does it take to write a great story? The power of, of good yarns, good narratives to um, pull people in is is uh, incredible. And I think my sort of amateur theory is that it's an evolutionary development that if you're, um, you know, a uh, uh, cave person sitting around a fire to a reality and see what you're describing, then you've just conferred an incredibly important advantage on the people who've heard that story. Yeah. Right? And so they know a bunch of stuff now about how to stay alive that they could not have learned in any other way. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, animals who don't have speech, though, they might warn each other. They might make a sound that says, danger, danger. Um, but uh, but it, as far as we know, they can't tell more complicated stories. No. So it's a part of us. Yeah, I, the, 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 the collective intelligence seems to be one of the, the key characteristics of, the, of Homo sapiens, the ability to share ideas and hold ideas together in our minds and storytelling is the fundamental aspect of that maybe even language itself is more fun found upon as it's pulpy or it's exploitative but um, for me i don't have any compunctions whatsoever about that i like stories that um are grabby and fun and exciting to read and once you've got one of those going, once you've got a good yarn going that people will enjoy reading, then you're free to do whatever you want uh, in the frame of that story. Uh, but if you don't have that, um, then you got nothing. Possible. How does that add to the to to Bob telling the story or telling the story about Bob? Or on the campfire well the main thing that it does is um present um little details that you might not have come up with on your own so if you're just sitting there freely imagining things um you uh you your your brain probably isn't going to serve up the wealth of details and the resulting complications and surprises that real that the real world is constantly presenting us with. And so um, in my case, if I'm um, trying to write a story about, you know, some that involves some technology like a, a rocket or a orbital maneuvers or whatever, then delving into those details eventually is going to turn up some weird, unexpected, you know, thing that... Uh, gives me material to work with, but also subliminally readers who see that are, are going to be drawn in more uh, because it's, they're going to, uh, to, to find that, um, oh, I didn't see that coming, you know, 
you know, it's got some of the complexity and surprise value of the real world. Yeah, it does something. Um, uh, Alex Garland, director who did, uh, who wrote, uh, directed uh, Ex Machina. I, I think about AI movies, and the more care you take in making it accurate, the more compelling the story becomes. Somehow, I'm not. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, maybe because it becomes more real to the people writing the story. Maybe it just makes you a better writer. The key to any storytelling is getting the the readers to suspend their their disbelief. The most impossible question for an author to answer, but which Neil Stevenson book should one read first? So when people ask me that, I, I usually ask them what they like to read, right? Because, uh, I mean, there's the best known one is probably Snow Crash, but that's a, a cyberpunk novel that's at the same time making fun of cyberpunk. Um, so it's kind of got some layers to it that uh, might not seem so funny if you don't have that, if you don't get the joke, right? So... Um, there's, uh, I've written, as you point out, I've written historical novels. Some people like those. Some people prefer those. So if that's what you like, then Cryptonomicon or the Baroque cycle is where you would start. If you like sort of techno thrillers that are set in a modern day setting, but aren't science fiction-y per se, then, uh, Reem-D, um, is one of those, and Termination Shock um, is 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 definitely one of those. Um, so it just depends on on uh, what people like. What what uh, when people a long time ago recommend I read Snow Crash, they said uh, it's the uh, it's Neil Stevenson light. Hmm. It's it's the. Uh, like if you don't want to be overwhelmed by the depth, like the rigor uh -huh. of a book, like that's a good that's a good introduction yeah. to the okay. man. Okay. So so essentially, you broke it down by topics, but if you wanted to read all of them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's a good introduction to the to the man? Because obviously, these worlds are very different. Yeah. The philosophies are very different. Yeah. What, what's a good introduction to the human? Um. Hmm. People ask the same thing of Dostoevsky. People, are, <laughs> it's a, it's a hard one to answer. Maybe Seven Eves, because it's got big themes. Um, it's you know it's about heavy, heavy things happening to the human race. Um, uh, it it does go kind of deep eventually on how rockets work and orbital mechanics and all that stuff, but um, people were able to get through it anyway, or some people just skip over that. It's fine, you know. Um, As an author, let me ask you, what books had a big impact on your life that you've read? Is there any that jumped to mind that uh, you learned? Yeah, just it's, yeah, because like where you found the book too, like right? The part, the time in your life where you found it, yeah. Who recommended it? That's also part of the story. Yeah. So there's definitely that. There's, you know, I, I circle back to Moby. Satisfying than that. Um, what was the first powerful book you remember reading that like convinced you that this form? could have depth hmm. was it moby dick was it like in high school i'm trying to remember well moby dick was definitely a big one um i mean i used to read a lot of classics comics when i was i don't know if you've seen these it's a whole series of comic books that um uh it was viral you could uh in the in the back of each comic book was an order form you could check some boxes and fill out your address and mail it in, <clears throat> and more would show up. But it was like 
they would do the Count of Monte Cristo, you know, Moby Dick, <laughs> you know, Robert Louis Stevenson, Rob, Robinson Crusoe, you know, all the sort of classic books uh, were they had put into comic book form. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. Reading Moby Dick, if you're nine years old, is a tall order. The, there's some very complicated sentences in there. Yeah. Um, and a lot of digressions. But if you're just looking at the comic book, it's like, holy shit, look at that whale, you know. Um, Which do is an inspiration for some of your work. I mean, you, you've obviously done like really a lot of research for the books you, you do. Roger Penrose. What, uh, do you remember a book that made you want to become a writer? Or a moment that made you become a I be think like the, you know, the answer I usually give is that when I was in like fifth grade, <clears throat> one of my friends came to school one day. He was wearing leather shoes, like dress shoes. And I hated dress shoes because mine never fit. And so they were uncomfortable. I couldn't run. You know, they were cold. It was Iowa. So I kind of said, I remember very clearly thinking, okay, I don't like where this is going. Like, does this mean that next year all of the kids are going to be wearing leather shoes? <clears throat> so I, I need to find a job where I don't have to do that. So that was... Loving torturing you right Greatest now. ever non Stevenson. Do we include fantasy? Or does it have to be science fiction? Oh, interesting. Fantasy. Hmm. I, I did not expect that twist. Uh, well, in, for in a weird way, they're lumped together in people's yeah. minds, right? So they are, but it, they're, they're, but there's also a boundary somehow. Yeah. I'm not no, sure what that is exactly. Nobody is. It's a mystery. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, if we do include it, then it's easily the the Lord of the Rings. Mm. Um, but, uh, I mean, greatness is a interesting quality to, uh, to try to define. Um, and for me, uh, a lot of the, the fun and the joy of, of such books is, is not in what you'd call greatness, but just storytelling. So I was always a big fan of Have, have Space Suit Will Travel, which is a Heinlein young adult book. It's just, uh, it's just a fun, good read. Yeah. Um, so. So, so but growing up in Ames, <clears throat> um, Dan Gable was uh, a few years older than me, and so sometimes we would go to the arena at the university and watch wrestling meets. And uh, and this was before his Olympic career. So everyone knew he was the star of that team. Same space as Dan Gable. Like well, from two. 100 feet away, a little dot on the mat <laughs> trouncing his opponents. Him and, him and Chris Taylor, so the other star was this 400 pound plus guy named Chris Taylor who uh, also went to the Olympics. So yeah, people, you know, he was, he was a no, he was a, a, a athletic hero and wrestling is, there's certain states like Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Iowa, where wrestling is the sport because those are states of small towns. And so if you're a small town, if you're like Dan Gable, uh, and you have to be on a football team with 20 other guys who are not Dan Gable, then no matter how good you are, your team might might suck. Mm -hmm. uh, but if in a solo thing, you can, you can go to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of wrestling in our gym classes in school, and I didn't like it. And I think partly it's just that it was so so competitive and the people who were who cared about it really cared about it a lot you know and so <clears throat> it was it was pretty tough i didn't think i had the right body type 
But then when I was, uh, after college, I was in Iowa City for a few years when he was coaching the the, the wrestling team there. And he, he won like nine championships out of 10 years you know, during that during that time. So he was both the greatest individual wrestler of all time and like the greatest team coach. Um, so I ne- I've never met him, but we've, uh, he's kind of been like in my sphere of awareness since I was. This is the Lex Free Podcast.